There's um, there's currently, as we speak over here, there's an anti-slap coalition meeting going on. Um, I think all of you are part of uh, that group as well. And uh, uh, Michael was speaking about uh, some work they're doing to gather documents. Uh, and maybe if we get some time, we can talk a little bit about SLAP as well. Okay, excellent. So I think we are live and all right. Um, um, welcome everybody. Um, first off, uh, my name is Karen Nazish. I'm the founding director of the Coalition for Women in Journalism. Uh, we are a support and advocacy organization uh, for women journalists and a lot of our work um, that was recently launched, uh, the press freedom work that has, was recently launched in 2019 uh, we, we were launched in 2018, uh, but uh, press freedom work that was launched in 2019 has taken more, uh, you know, prominence. Um, and in that, we, a press freedom newsroom covers documentation, uh, document uh, violations against women and LGBTQ journalists um, from 128 countries. Um, this includes um, online trolling campaigns and misinformation campaigns. Um, a lot of digital violence, but also physical violence that includes detentions, um, uh, physical violence, police violence, uh, imprisonment, slap cases, um, and even murders. Um, and um, part of this work uh, obviously includes advocacy in which we do different forms of thing apart from um, providing emergency support, support to women journalists, most recently, airlifting Afghan women journalists um, after the Taliban takeover um, and assisting Ukrainian journalists in relocating. We have also been um, involved in doing other advocacy work, um, including campaigns, working with different stakeholders, organizations, governments, um, public representatives to lobby for the safety for women journalists in different parts of the world. Um, today, we are very happy um, to be joined by this panel of um, uh, people who are working on making instrumental changes um, and help and bringing some hope in this very difficult environment. Um, Ejit Tamelkaran, one of the panelists, she could not be here today and um, because of an emergency, uh, this is something that is a perpetual scenario for journalists. Um, she could not uh, make it because of a visa issue um, and she has to sort out some documents. So, um, but her work is incredible and I would really, um, you know, urge everyone to check out her, if you haven't already, uh, to read her book called How to Lose a Country um, and the latest title Together, both of which I find to be excellent recipes to make um, the hope possible, um, the hope that we are here together to talk about. Um, so I'm going to um, start with introducing the current panelists who are present. Um, um, speaking of hope, um, I will move to the new president of CPJ, Jody Ginsburg. Um, it is indeed hopeful that a prominent and powerful press freedom organization will now be led by a woman. Congratulations to Jody and all of us women journalists who may feel included and represented in this appointment. Um, Jody is not new to this work of protecting journalists and defending press freedom. Um, she has spent a thorough and busy decade doing <laughs> this work, most recently at Internews, but before that at Index of Censorship, um, where she was a CEO. Um, I've heard wonderful things about Jody's openness and compassion um, for journalists all, from all backgrounds and countries. In her career, she has fought for many behind bars and led successful advocacy campaigns. In the recent New York Times profile, Jody pointed out that she believes journalism is essential if we want to have free, independent, and tolerant societies. Most recently, I encountered uh, Jody's work while we were airlifting um, Afghan journalists and running into trouble with certain governments, including the UK. Uh, we witnessed Jody mobilizing a campaign to push the UK government to do better. Thank you, Jody, for this work, and we look forward to working with you in your new position. 
Thank you. Um, next, uh, I will introduce the Vice President of Values and Transparency of the, at the European Union, Yera Yerova. I'm a huge fan of Yera. Um, her work is inspiring as it reintegrates human, civilian, and citizen values into big institutions like the EU. Hungary's Orban, who has not been a friend of press freedom, um, demanded that she be stripped of her position precisely because Yera's work has been an inconvenience to those who do not want transparency. Um, Yera Yerova is one of the finest female leaders in our time in an environment of perpetual institution failures and paralysis of democratic values in many EU states. Yera's work and commitment is shattering some of the stubborn moles that do not benefit citizens uh, in the EU. Yera is one of the first voices amongst EU leadership who have fiercely stood for transparency in democracies and protection of journalists who often risk their lives to tell the truth. VP Yera Yerova is a friend and ally in our fight against anti-democratic and anti-equity states that have made accountability journalism a minefield for journalists. One such journalist who lost her life is Daphne Caruana Galizia. Daphne was a Maltese journalist and anti-corruption activist whose reportage exposed corrupt politicians in Malta. Her sister, Corinne Bella, is with us today. Welcome, Corin. Um, Corin, thank you for joining us. Um, Corin is prominent representative of the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation. She leads the foundation's media relations and edits Taste and Flair, the monthly magazine with da that Daphne founded in 2014, and which the foundation has continued to publish. Corin previously spent many years working in the media and communications. Um, she is. She, alongside Daphne's um, sons, have been working very hard for the accountability of um, the, the cases that have emerged after Daphne's death. Uh, we will get into some of the some of the litigations that continued and uh, perhaps talk about that with Corin. Um, I will um, just give a little bit of uh, you know uh, introduction into some of the reasons why we are here. Um, indeed, we are here in difficult times where we are witnessing an increasing uh, political success of populist leaders that is imperiling our democracies and human rights worldwide. At the CFWIJ, we monitor and document press freedom attacks against women and LGBTQ journalists. Since our launch of the Press Freedom Newsroom in 2019, we have seen a consistent rise of imprisonments, police violence, misinformation campaigns um, that target women journalists. The spread of COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, Lebanon Blast, uh, perpetual censorship in Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, Mexico, Belarus, Hungary have shown a spike in these cases against women journalists uh, and have put many women journalists behind bars. This year alone, we documented six murders of women journalists only in the first quarter of 2022. Um, in Eastern Europe, we have seen a rise of police violence, legal abuse, vexatious litigations against women journalists. With, uh, in, in Afghanistan, we have seen women journalists being targeted before and after the takeover of Taliban. Um, in, in the last two years, we have not only been assisting women journalists in more persecuted countries, such as Afghanistan or the Kurdish journalists in Turkey or the Dalit journalists in rural India, um, but also Polish and Belarusian journalists in Eastern Europe who are targeted. Um, you know, women journalists are facing all kinds of state harassment on the ground. On the top of the pandemic size of online trolling, hacking attempts and verbal threats in their lives. Um, even in Canada, where I am right now, um, right wing politicians have leaked personal information in an attempt to smear women journalists and in effect sending a troll army, making Canada one of the top countries of smear campaigns in September 2021 for women journalists that we documented out of 180, 128 countries. Um, a trend that from what used to, you know, we used to think exists in repressive countries now have seeped into the so-called progressive countries and that for all 
um, of us is and should be worrying. Um, these women are just doing their job. So in these difficult times um, at the CFWIJ, we don't want to get carried away in the overwhelming numbers and sorrow we experience every day as we document these violations against women and LGBTQ journalists. We want to think and work on solutions. Our goal is to sniff around on what is hopeful and useful and think of solutions that in effect can fix our broken democracies. In the age of misinformation, we want to counter that misinformation. All of today's panel holds the substance for some of these solutions in their work. Allow me to welcome you in this conversation. I am going to start with um, Corin Bella. Um, thank you, Corin. Again, um, just before this panel started, um, I was listening to your brother uh, speaking at the anti-slap um, coalitions, and um, you, you you are all working so hard on making sure that there is accountability in journalism. And thank you so much for that work. Um, um, if I may start, you know, at the time of her assassination, Daphne Caruana Galizia in 2017, there were 47 litigations running, many in the UK um, that your fa family has still been dealing with. Um, can you talk a little bit about what have been your challenges in this environment, dealing with this, um, and, um, you know, what you think um, can be done to make sure that these um this environment does not persist yes certainly so at the time of daphne's murder i have to say um it was my nephew who you were in a meeting with so, so that's daphne's son who's the director of the foundation i work for and at the time of daphne's murder there were 47 cases against her still active in the courts here in malta five of those were criminal defamation cases which collapsed when she was killed. But if they had succeeded, they would have landed her in jail. And criminal defamation remains a problem in Europe. So this is a problem journalists continue to face. The civil cases were inherited by Daphne's husband and sons as her heirs. Um, I, my understanding is that this doesn't really happen anywhere else in Europe. Um, the cases remained live for a long time. Some cases were concluded, some were withdrawn. They've managed to fight the number of cases down, but five are still pending four and a half years after Daphne's murder. One of those cases by the former prime minister and his wife, another by a former minister and his wife. Both men resigned in disgrace eventually, but that was in 2019, and that was three years after Daphne had first reported on the minister's Panama company. So this sort of is a snapshot of just how egregious the situation can be for an individual journalist in a European Union member state in 2021. So the, the, the cases um, collapsed in the criminal defamation cases collapsed, but that is only because Daphne was killed. It is a terrible way for a criminal defamation case to be defeated, is for the, the target to be killed. But it, her murder did trigger you know, a huge outcry and focused a lot of attention on the use of the courts and the use of the law to, to defeat its spirit. So what we're talking about here is slaps, you know, an orchestrated campaign to drain the time and resources of an individual journalist with the intention of silencing her and putting off anybody else who might take up her stories. And to a, a tragic extent, it does succeed. Because as Daphne herself said in an interview just before she was killed, People look at me and think, I don't want that to happen to me, you see. So slaps became, you know, a, a, you know, a, one of the biggest problems facing journalists in Europe. And it became one of the reasons that the foundation exists. This is to campaign to end slaps across Europe. It is a terrible burden to carry as an individual journalist. It's an even worse, you know, it's an equally severe burden for the family to carry after that journalist is killed because you're put in a position of having to answer a claimant who sued your parent. At the time of great trauma, you're having to go to court and address claims against your parent. And having to fight a case when your primary witness is dead. You see? The only way you could defeat the case in, in many instances 
is by exposing sources. And of course, that is something you won't do. If you summon a source as a witness, and that's assuming you know who the source is in the first place, but summing a source as a witness would expose that source and would undermine all the work that a journalist has, has, has done up to then to protect that source. I mean, Daphne protected her sources with her life. She, she would never have exposed them. So this is, it's a terrible situation to be in. And it's one of the reasons why the campaign to end slaps has had such, such a strong push from our family. Thank you so much, Corinne. And indeed, um, you know, it, it must be so difficult um, for your family. And, you know, you know uh, I always say um, when journalists get targeted, a lot of some of my friends have been killed and uh, yeah. I have seen targeting as well. I myself was targeted as well, which is why I formed this organization. Uh, it is so difficult for families to get involved. And you have yeah. done such a great job in getting involved and making um, you know, other organizations and stakeholders accountable. Um, in that, can I, you know, ask a little bit about your involvement with SLAP and, you know, what do you think, how, um, how is it constructive um, and your role in it? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Um, I meant, I meant, you know, if you can talk a little bit about SLAP um, cases and, you know, your family has been involved um, thoroughly in these cases, have led a lot of campaigns um, and pushed for accountability against slap cases. If you can talk a little bit about that involvement, how that came about. Um, and then, you know, if, you know, there are challenges, how you are thinking, um, what are the things, tools needed to solve those challenges? Yes, certainly. So the, the cases, as I explained, were inherited by Daphne's husband and sons as her direct heirs. Uh, I support uh, Matthew principally in the work that the foundation does to, to help end slaps. One of the, one of the um, clauses in the statute of the foundation is actually to campaign to end slaps. And the motive for that is Daphne's experience. So for a long time, there was little recognition of the problem because, as you know, slaps work in silence. Journalists uh, and other activists are targeted and warned not to continue talking about something, not even about the threats they're receiving. So the first time a slap becomes public is when somebody's actually sued. And when that happens, there's usually been a whole history behind, you know, behind a sort of, you know, repetitive threats, letters being received, you know, threatening severe damages. I mean, this is something that happened to Daphne. We mentioned libel tourism earlier, the use of the UK courts. There was a company that, uh, sued, that threatened to sue Daphne in the London courts when they knew full well there was no basis. There was no evidence of the damage they were claiming. They simply wanted to threaten her into silence. And, and you know, with, with a, somebody with a lesser spirit would, 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 would perhaps break under the strain. But you know, even if you are strong spirited, and the, even if you are a fighter, as Daphne was, it's a terrible waste of your time and resources. So fighting back against slaps has been a you know a platform of you know the campaign to, to change the system that that made Daphne's murder possible, because among other things, which uh, you know were noted, something we knew but were noted in a public inquiry which closed last year into the circumstances of Daphne's murder, it was a combination of factors that made her her murder possible. And one of those factors was that people in government were using their power to silence her. And one of the tools they used was the courts. So we had a situation where government could reasonably argue we can't interfere in the work of the courts, you know, because of separation of powers. But at the same time, representatives of government, including the prime minister, would, in the guise of an ordinary citizen, use the law to open a case against the journalist and then back that with the full force of the public office, you see, and all the media that are at their disposal. It's an intolerable situation and it takes a lot to resist it. And even if you can resist it, you shouldn't be doing that yourself. Governments have a positive obligation to create an environment in which journalists are able to do their jobs safely. And um, that is why there, 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 was this, there has been this campaign. So over the years, a coalition of NGOs has formed, the Coalition to End Slaps in Europe, and has had, you know, had meetings with Vice, there have been meetings with Vice President Jourova on the subject. And uh, that culminated recently in the, the recent announcement on 27th of April of 
a package of measures directing member states to take action to end slaps within the EU. And the coalition works on a wider context, you know, to, to target all member states of the Council of Europe with the idea that eventually Europe will be a safe place for journalists to work. Ending slaps is a huge part of that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, you know, uh, Vice President Yera is here as well, uh, who has been so involved in, in slap cases, and we will talk to her mm -hmm. about that. But first, let me come to you, Jody. Um, um, Jody, one of the crucial things you have done really well um, in your career is design and strategize effective campaigns to protect free speech. Um, in your boarding let onboarding letter um, during the CPJ, you mentioned uh, we need to build better solidarity and optimism, uh, you know, which is uh, which is so integral and so timely. Um, we can't agree more. Um, what are your recommendations for different stakeholders who are interested in an equitable, inclusive, and uh, free speech, uh, free media? Well, obviously, it's a huge topic, and I think. One of the things I would say, particularly on this topic around women journalists, is a lot of the focus often when we talk about media freedom is on um, what you might call the high profile issues. You know, the worst thing that can yeah. possibly happen is the murder of a journalist. Um, but as Corinne has already said, often there's a, a, a whole list of things that lead up to that point that make that killing avoidable. And we've seen consistently over the past, certainly five years, 10 years, a number of features that show that journalists and particularly women journalists are at risk. So that might be uh, misuse of law, as we've heard in these cases, the inappropriate use of law, threatening letters, threatening legal letters in an effort to get people to stop reporting. You know, it's exhausting, it's expensive. Um, these cases go on for years and years and years, and in some cases even past the death of the individual. They're very deliberately intended to uh, exhaust you so that you stop reporting. But that's not the only kind of harassment that journalists face. Increasingly, we see the online harassment of journalists. And again, the people who receive disproportionate harassment online are women and generally women of color. And again, that's intended to make you think twice about reporting. Who wants to wake up in the morning to hundreds of threats of death, rape, uh, threats towards your family, potentially the publication of your address? This happens to journalists repeatedly, women journalists repeatedly everywhere in the world. It's not, it's not limited to particular countries, sadly. We see it everywhere from India to Brazil, the UK, the US, across Europe, and, and I know that's something the European Commission is thinking very hard about. A couple of things we can do. I think um, one of the things we can really think about is digital self-care and solidarity. It is heartening to me the numbers of journalists and particularly women journalists who come out very vocally in support of their colleagues when they face this kind of harassment. And that's really important. What helps bullies succeed is when they feel that somebody is operating alone. If you think that somebody is vulnerable and isolated, it gives you power. So we can take away a bully's power by ensuring that they know that they have wide and vocal support. So speaking out very publicly against that as the journalistic community, but also the political community. I'm heartened by the fact that we're starting to see political leaders now roll back on some of that very aggressive rhetoric that we heard from President Donald Trump and the like that, that painted journalists as the enemies of the people as evil. When you get that kind of rhetoric from on high, that feeds down to ordinary people who think that they have carte blanche to attack your mind because you're not human. You know, journalists are human beings and uh, it has a huge impact on them as individuals, but also for society if they're not able to report freely. So I think that kind of solidarity, hearing that from newsrooms, making sure newsrooms know that their journalists are supported, having journalist communities speak out against individuals who are targeted, and then having political leaders demonstrate vocally that they support um, 
uh, they support journalists. And then thirdly, I think we need to think very hard about how we are, um, how we are moderating, particularly online content, and in a very careful way. I'm, I'm, you know, as you as you know, I come from a free expression background. I think we have to be very careful at balancing the controls we put in place, <coughs> harass and to silence, with ensuring people can speak freely and publish freely. And I think sometimes the knee jerk reaction came from politicians is to swing the pendulum too far in one direction and that that may end up meaning that we are closing the space for independent free journalism as opposed to opening up so those those are one of the things i think we need to think about very carefully and i'll stop there thank you jolie and i will come back to some of some of that digital violence and there are some you know some extensions of this conversation. I will move to um, Vice President uh, Yera Yurova. Um, Yera, you have been vigilantly involved in transparency and accountability work in the European Union, one of the most prominent voices from the EU to spearhead support for journalists. Uh, protection. Um, you know, it was, I think, almost one of the first times that I heard, um, you know, an e EU leader to be taking this issue so seriously. Um, so thank you for that. And so perhaps if we can begin um, by describing the importance of this work um, in the EU uh, for you, and then if you can tell us a little bit about the Media Freedom Act um, that you have recently um, spearheaded as well, um, and what you hope to achieve from that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, 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 and thank you, Corinne and Jody, for, for inspirative words and, and also for enlightening me about about the situation from from your your specific angles um i uh, have to say that now i represent the commission which decided to do much more to protect uh, journalism uh, and journalists and why to protect journalism <laughs> because independent media uh, is uh, an element uh, of one of the basic pillars of european democracy and we uh, I, I found out that we do not have any special protection of, of media. Uh, we protect media sector as any other sector, like shoemakers or, or I don't know, uh, the, those who produce furniture. Uh, it, you know, we, we cannot rely on media uh, on such an important thing that they, they are the watchdogs of democracy and also fighters for, uh, for the truth because they are... Uh, the 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 main uh, actors in in uh, uh, the action against the disinformation uh, campaigns. Uh, so so we realize that we we need to do more. Uh, first of all, as I think it was Jody who said that killing is uh, uh, is avoidable. Uh, we uh, we see these uh, horrible cases, toughness assassination, and Jan Kuciak in Slovakia. Uh, many, many uh, injured journalists uh, in the EU. Uh, I, I, had, I had some statistics from 2020, 900 journalists uh, were injured in the EU states, in 22 states. So not only in the Eastern Europe, as, as Professor Kiran said, uh, uh, we see these cases everywhere. And in many cases, the journalists were injured by police. So that's why we decided to issue the recommendation uh, to, for the member states to uh, do more to uh, protect the journalists, uh, to proactively uh, take measures. For instance, Jan Kuciak was announcing the threats he was receiving through online, and the police did not react. And, and then, then he was murdered by, by the local mafia, which, uh, which was a really shocking case. And so, so this recommendation, it is a, it is a soft law. So the member states have a choice to follow or not to follow. But uh, I am, con I am, I try to convince all uh, to do more and uh, the recommendations to protect the journalists against uh, violence uh, contain a lot of practical things to be done. It's not a declaration. It's a, it's a to-do list. Um, we accompanied this recommendation by the anti-slap legislation. And I call the, the legislation Daphne's law. I promised uh, to uh, Corinne, I promised it to your parents and to Matthew, your nephew, that uh, 
I will, I will do my best to protect journalists much better also against the abusive lawsuits. And uh, you are absolutely right, Corina, when you say that there was a very little recognition of the problem still several years ago. And, and Daphne's case opened eyes of many. And that's why I sometimes say that Daphne was working with me on the legislation. And you know what's in it. We try uh, to uh, minimize the possibility to, to abuse the, uh, the litigations or the, 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 the justice system in another country, but also to convince the member states uh, to take measures uh, to uh, uh, not, not to let ju justice or judiciary system being abused against the journalists and human rights defenders. So uh, we, we want uh, the cases once, once started and once the judge finds out that, uh, that there is this uh, abusive nature of the process, just the process for the process uh, to uh, impose the pressure on, on, on uh, journalists and, and human rights defenders through the process and to starve them out, to deprive them of money and time and energy. We want the judges to stop uh, the, the case as soon as possible so, so that it doesn't last, I don't know, months or, or years. Uh, I will not go into details. You, you probably know what's, what's in it. Uh, but also to react on, on what uh, I think Corina said about the criminal uh, defamations, uh, which I believe should be ended up. So we also recommend it to member states to only uh, enable the, the processes uh, at the courts um, on the basis of civil or administrative law, not the criminal law. And also we recommend strongly the member states not to uh, 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 impose the, the penalty of jail on, on the journalists who will be, who will be sued for, for defamation. So, so a lot of things. Uh, and I believe that uh, the anti-slap will, will fly well, but I will have to convince uh, uh, several member states uh, which already reacted through the ministers of justice that we have to guarantee the free access to the courts for everybody. And as Corina said, that yet the cases against Daphne were, uh, were launched uh, or, or submitted to the courts by the prime minister. And what the ministers of justice tell me, also the prime ministers, they were not that explicit, but also the politicians, active politicians, or the uh, rich people should, should have an access to the court. My answer on it, yes, but there must be the well-founded well and justified case. There, yeah, there might, must be the evidence, not, not just the discomfort that the the journalist wrote something wrong about me and i am rich and i am i'm i'm famous i can i can uh silence him or her especially her as, as we speak about it now uh, by by means of judiciary uh process and there are, can I just, uh, sorry I, I just wanted to add and i think i think the key point here and i think it's been recognized in the work that you've done and and also the work that the uk is doing on this is that access isn't equal if one side has huge, almost bottomless funds and the others don't. And as we know, one of the challenges facing journalism at the moment is, you know, it is not a, a wealthy profession. Often these individuals are going after one, a single journalist, they're not even going after a media outlet. And, and so you have that huge inequality of resources. Uh, and I think a lot of the efforts that, that mm -hmm your spearheading and others are spearheading is to try and really um, redress that balance, mm -hmm. that inequality of, of yeah. financial power. And, and you were right, because you said that this has also the gender dimension. Uh, we, we see uh, a lot of cases against uh, the women journalists who are freelancers or who work for small media houses, which do not have the financial buffer to finance the, the proceedings yeah, or the, the, the defense. So, so it's it's uh, all, all true, and I think that we are doing the proper thing uh, to legislate, and also, of course, we will speak to UK authorities uh, to to come along with us uh, and to to put an end to this horrible practice. 
Uh, before I say a few words on about the Media Freedom Act, which uh, Kiran asked me about, um, I want to say that we also adopted as, as the European Commission the, uh, the Directive Against Violence Against Women, which for the first time contains digital violence specifically targeted on women. And, and here I think that we can double the effort also through this legislation. But I don't want to speak too long. On, on the Freedom, Media Freedom Act, it's the last big uh, part of our mosaic of the things we want to do to protect uh, media and journalists in Europe. Uh, it should be adopted in July. So over, the, over May and, and June, I will lead uh, a lot of consultations with, with the, the experts because I want to do this right. Uh, we uh, want to address uh, the already very visible problems. So for instance, the tran trans transactions, draft laws or administrative decisions in member states that hinder the operation in the market of certain players or directly aim to put them out of the market. So in other words, the economic pressure. We want to address the political pressure, the uh, use of public money, to corrupt media uh, so that they are nice to those in power yeah we and we we have no chance to 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 minimize this uh this bad practice also we need to see more uh, transparency of ownership of the media we will look into the mergers of media which will not uh, mean consolidation, but rather the concentration so that they are easier to, to manipulate or to influence. Uh, and the media themselves fear that we will regulate them. And my answer is the Media Freedom Act should regulate the environment for the media and introduce the safeguards uh, against uh, the, the economic and political pressures uh, which are minimizing the chance of media to survive as, as a truly independent uh, power in the society. Uh, so uh, instead of micromanaging, uh, we will try to set uh, some common rules and principles uh, for transparency of ownership, for, the, for independence, also for the public media, which is especially very sensitive and some member states are already uh, very fearful that we will want to destroy the system which works. This is not my plan. I want to set the standards so that we can act when, it, when we see negative trend in, in some member state. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ira. And I, I have to say that Media Freedom Act is so um, it's it's so hopeful and a great effort. Uh, this is something that I definitely wanted um, you to touch upon. I must mention that um, that with EU, a few countries that I noted are just the countries where we have documented top violations, which where Eastern Europe seems to be, you know, more perpetual. Poland, Belarus, um, Hungary. Um, but definitely, and you know, more recently, Ukraine um, in a very different dynamic, you know, in a war dynamic. Um, but these other countries have been very. Um, um, there's a lot of censorship in these other Eastern European countries. But most recently, um, you know, the numbers that we got in Europe in the last one year was 147 violations against women journalists alone. Um, two of them were LGBTQ journalists. And um, in fact, we published an Eastern Euro a report focused on Eastern Europe becoming I'm sorry, Europe coming and becoming one of the uh, one of the regions that we are concerned about, um, and in that Eastern Europe, essentially because there's more numbers in terms of data, um, there are greater concerns. And um, you know, essentially, Jody was mentioning um, you were talking about online trolling, um, and you know, in terms of online trolling and violations, I would say one thing that we see every day is oftentimes women journalists who are women of color, women journalists from diverse backgrounds, a lot of refugee journalists. There's a huge mm. uh, population of refugee journalists now from all over the world who work in different countries. And 
oftentimes because of language, because of lack of support systems, because of lack of backing from newsrooms, they are um, the ones who are most vulnerable. They do not get um, ally intervention, for example. Um, they do not get people to back them when they are trolled, etc. And they're oftentimes also um, the ones not um, having access to resources or support systems. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could, um, Jody, touch a little bit about, uh, for, on that, about you know how to protect freelancers and how we can pay more attention to um, this um, group of journalists. So you're absolutely right. And I think one of the key changes we've seen over the past couple of years is that huge outflow of journalists who are having to leave their countries because they are at risk and then setting up um, as exile journalists where like any exile population, they're incredibly vulnerable. And, and if you think about last year, we had um, Myanmar, we had Afghanistan, and now we have Ukraine where there's huge both uh, displacement of journalists out of country, but then even within a country and that creates vulnerabilities because you're not um, with your family or not with your community and you are incredibly vulnerable. Some of the ways that we can support that, I think, is to continue to support exiled journalists to do their work. I think we need to do more to support journalists with advice on not just on digital security, not just on dealing with online harassment, but things like how to set up a bank account, how to operate, how to make sure that you're able to operate legally, those kinds of, as uh, Vera talked about, those kinds of very practical assistance that enables you to operate. Financial security is really key in these situations. And oftentimes when people move, they have no sense of how the local banking system operates, the, the, what the network of support is, what the benefits you're entitled to. And I think those are areas where, as a community, we could do more to support journalists going to Excel. Sadly, I do not think this is a trend that I see reversing anytime soon. I, I think the trend is likely to be more towards people um, moving outside of their communities because of increased violence, uh, and vulnerability. So I think we need to think harder about how we can support those people, hopefully in a temporary way, because very much we hope, obviously, that people are able to report in their communities from their communities. But I think we have to recognize that we have a new reality and provide and look as certainly um, communities of, of media freedom organizations and, and others, how we can support that. I would suggest that um, one of the things that we would look to government for is a greater understanding of flexibility around visas for example one of the big struggles we had around Afghanistan as you will know is it was extraordinarily difficult even if you could get people out of country to obtain visas for people who were manifestly at risk because of the job that they were doing um, and that's really key you know if for example we have journalists in countries where they are targeted because they are journalists we would like to see government step up and issue emergency visas to give people safe harbour. And yet we're, we're not really seeing that. And that's something, for example, that the Media Freedom Coalition, which is a group of uh, now, I think, over 50 countries and 50 governments committed to media freedom, could really make a difference is by allowing special visas for journalists who are at risk to come and have safe harbour, at least for some time, so that they can continue to do their work, but are, are less at risk of, of persecution. Thank you, Jody. And there's there's a lot there. There's a lot more to work on. And I think, I mean, I wanted to touch a little bit about um, um, a little bit on, you know, um, how to collaborate better, um, you know, institutions that are interested in protecting journalists. That includes uh, press freedom protection organizations and um, people in governments. Like one of the things that we do sometimes is to work with politicians, opposition members or um, public representatives in different countries, Turkey, Pakistan, India, Mexico, uh, where we've been able to help, um, you know, uh, with, you know, finding protection mechanisms for women journalists or draft journalism and protection laws. I wonder if any of you can speak a little bit about, you know, that work, um, the importance of that work and, and where are we in your view um, in, in that collaboration that we very much need 
in democratic countries to collaborate between government, public representatives, and media protection um, organizations. Mm -hmm. If I may say uh, a few words about about this, as I, I said at the beginning, that for the Commission this is a pioneering work because for years we were more or less satisfied with the situation of media in the EU. And then we received the data sometimes, I don't know, three, four years ago from the Florence Institute, which uh, is uh, serving us as the data collector and, and the an analytics, uh, the, the, the body for the, uh, the uh, analyzing the data. And indeed, as you said, Kiran, uh, we saw especially bad data in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and so we started to, to explore the ways how to protect the media without interfering into the media freedom and, and pluralism, you know, because it is, it is dangerous. Sometimes I am asked, will you finance media directly? And I, I say, well, we, we have some funding uh, which is available for the media, but we will never fund the media directly because it would look like the Commission wants to influence by, by paying. Yeah, you, you understand well. Now we are making an exception by, by sending the, the, the money directly to Ukraine as a direct support uh, to, to the journalists and to the media there. We have already sent 6 million euros there to protect uh, or to, to, to enable the, the journalists to do the job in such horrible, dangerous circumstances. Uh, we pay the protective uh, uh, tools and uh, emergency support, the, the shelters and so on. But this is extraordinary situation uh, and we, we have to act, we have to help because they are our ears and eyes in Ukraine. Thanks to them, we know what's happening in the country. So it's our obligation to support directly and we are finding, fin financing. But coming back to your question, I have to say that it's not very um, usual situation that the public body like government or the commission uh, proactively uh, does something to uh, promote the media and support the media. And I had one moment of truth when we uh, adopted the, the big package of money for the recovery after COVID, I myself pushed the member states to take part of the money to, and to create some grant scheme, especially for the regional and local media so that they can survive. And it was only Sweden and Denmark who created those grant schemes. Paradoxically, the states which do not need it so much <laughs> and the rest, well, I think they didn't know what to do. Uh, so the money didn't go to, to the media uh, and I was, I was rather disappointed. But also I, I realized at that moment that in fact, I do not have a strong partner in the member states for this. I speak to the minister, ministries of culture and they are not traditionally the strongest uh, ministries in, in the European member states governments. So uh, I think that uh, there is still, it still requires some time uh, when we will see in the European member states uh, some bodies in within the governments which will systematically deal with media issues without interfering. Yeah, because now for the recommendation on, on safety, I discuss with the ministers of home affairs. Uh, uh, on SLAP, I discuss with the ministers of, of uh, justice. Uh, and uh, the Media Freedom Act will be discussed with the ministers of European affairs even. The, the, the universal soldiers. Yeah, so it, it doesn't have address in our member states. And it's not a complaint, it's just a description of the current situation. 
Yeah, and I think that what the work that you're doing is is actually, you know, is um, I, I will tell you that it is inspiring for a lot of other politicians that I do know, uh, in Turkey and Pakistan, who have been trying to do similar work, um, but to no avail. And I think depending on where you are in the world also affects. There's There are plenty of public representatives, people in the government who are interested in supporting and defending the media because they believe in democratic democracy and the you know the values of democratic system um but they you know i i i personally know some of them who have had a lot of challenges and i think your work essentially uh, inspires that and also is changing evolving um that system um that has you know that that is not in place so i think that what the challenges that you're facing with not having um you know people to work with is something that's going to evolve and um and and we as journalists wish you all the best for that i just before leaving i just briefly wanted to touch a little bit on misinformation um i you know that is a huge part and uh you know of violations against journalists and censorship and is used as a tool oftentimes you know in smear campaigns and all of that um i know yara you have been working um also on investing uh into fact checking tools and um giving um donations to organizations that are doing that work um you know some of the challenges on that front as well but that is very instrumental but if uh, jody if i could come to you and and you know maybe if there are any um remarks you have about how to counter that misinformation and what can we do in this current environment um your thoughts on that well, I think the first thing to say is an incredibly complex mis and disinformation comes from so many different sources and the ways that we can handle it are very different. I think what's very interesting to me in the context of this debate around gender and journalism is uh, a recent UNESCO report showed quite clearly how misinformation also had a, a gendered lens and misinformation was um, part and parcel of the harassment that we were seeing of journalists. So deliberate smear campaigns against against journalists, um, trying to discredit them. Um, and obviously, once you discredit a journalist and you, you so doubt about their um, authenticity and trustworthiness, that opens the door for them to be attacked in other ways, verbally or, or physically. And so I think initiatives to support fact checking, I think there are numbers of ways of doing that. Uh, and I don't think there's a one size fits all model. One of the things that we saw very clearly with COVID and why I was so pleased to see um, mention in the funding initiatives for local journalism is the role that local media played in countering mis and disinformation. We often think of these things as being high level. If only we could get Facebook or Google to fix the problem, it would go away. Actually, some of the most successful methods for countering mis and disinformation have come from supporting local media local fact checking groups who are able to address within a local context the kinds of mis and disinformation that they're seeing which may come from an, another country entirely um, but, but they're able to counter it in a way that makes sense to the local community and so I think one of the best and most cost effective ways that we can tackle misinformation is to invest and support local and community media and particularly mm -hmm. media that supports <laughs> marginalized communities. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you. And um, Yara, if I would you like to speak a little bit about the, on, on, on your work on account dreams information, I only ask because I know that you have been aware of this and you have also been working on um, you know, countering misinformation, giving funds to organizations that are able to work with technicians who can do fact checking and all of that. Mm. Yeah, well, I don't want to grab too much time <laughs> because I have this every day on my table and, and it's complex, as Jody said. Um, we, uh, I, I more and more believe that the best uh, and the only uh, efficient tool or, or weapon, weapon, yeah, we are in the war, I will say weapon, against this information, which is now used as a weapon against us, by the way. Yeah, now we are in in a new stage of it. So the best best way to, to counter that is to support uh, the truth. And when I say support the truth, as a politician, you might start fearing that <laughs> I mean some propaganda. 
not at all. I mean, uh, to have to be able to rely on sufficient sources and, and sufficient pot, uh, powers who will uh, collect the facts and who will deliver the facts to the people who will make their informed choice. And we see well how propaganda works in Russia, that Putin can do whatever. He will have the blessing of his people for everything he's doing. Because the people are blind and deaf, because the disinformation is just uh, uh, killing every possible channel or, or source of, of, of facts and, and the truth. We are a democratic society, so we want to protect the freedom of speech. But at the same time, we have to repeat now, especially at this moment of the war, that the freedom of speech does, does have some limits. Does have some limits. And that if we would plea or protect the absolute freedom of speech, we would absolutely disregard the truth because when you realize what what's happening now uh when uh, we are under permanent campaign are uh, under permanent attacks from the side side of the trolls from from petersburg and, and other places in russia and we we simply have to defend ourselves better so what we do we have now the D D digital services act which uh, obliges and pushes the platforms and uh, the dig digital operators to proactively uh, uh, remove crime, which is not disinformation, but it's hate speech. And you mentioned also hate speech against the women journalists and uh, the women of color journalists. This is essential that we are not willing to tolerate any more hate speech online. Uh, for disinformation, we created the code of practice where we want more, more fact checking, uh, where we, we really expect the journalists to play much more uh, uh, critical and important role. And I heard from many journalists that in our fight against disinformation, I want to instrumentalize the journalists, that, that they, they are here to do bigger work than just to a fact check or correct somebody's horrible, stupid lies or conspiracy theories. But I cannot help it. Without professional journalists, without those who are able to bring the facts, uh, we will never be able to counter disinformation in Europe. So it's a complex, a complex ma uh, matter. And I, I will finish it with, with one sentence. We need to have people more resilient in Europe more aware that they are easy targets for manipulation, which will turn against them and which is already turning against them. So education, awareness raising, media campaigning, uh, a lot of things to make the society more resilient. Because if, if we are easy targets, uh, Putin and others will win. And it's not only about Putin, this long lasting trend and we, we have to do something meaningful. Thank you so much, Gera, and, and thank you so much, um, Corin. I, I just want to say that uh, in, journalists are, you know, we're trying to figure out how to protect the essence of freedom of expression, which is to tell the truth. And I think a lot of institutions, um, journalism, press institutions are trying to work on figuring out how to work on that and how to do this work of public service that we do as journalists better. Um, thank you so much for, you know, um, all of the work that you are all doing. Um, Corin, you know, for, you know, we will be continuously working with you on uh, slap cases and uh, we, we will stay in touch regarding that. And uh, Yera, thank you so much for 
your remarks and for joining us and for the work you are doing for the protection of journalists and for caring about this. Um, I Jody, thank you. <laughs> Jody um, had to leave, uh, but you know we're looking forward to working with all of you. And uh, we are here, um, you know, just finally, I just want to say, please do all, you know, um, find some time to see some of our monthly quarterly reports because they tell you what the world looks like, what press freedom looks like for women journalists. Um, you know, in, in the first quarter of 2022, we have seen an increase of violations against um, women journalists again. Um, and it's been increasing since we have, you know, we started working with 12 countries and now we are covering 128 countries. And um, just to give you a little bit of idea, from 2019 to 2022, we have seen a 187% percent rise in violations and these are not just online trolling these are physical violations police violations legal violations slap cases and murders so i just you know want to say you know let's all pay attention and uh, work together to uh, figure this out thank you so much thank, thank you, you kieran and thank you thank you very much bye